Good afternoon to everyone. I think we'll make a, a start now. Uh, my name is Ronan Cormican. I convene the PhD Masterclasses. I'm very pleased to have Dr. Mazar Elahi along today to give us our Masterclass. Uh, Mazar is a graduate of um, IELTS and he is one of the few people that I know who has actually completed a PhD in under three years and is now practicing as a successful solicitor. Um, so the subject that Mazar will talk about is how to complete in three years and perhaps also a little talk about analysis and methodology and as ever it's designed as an informal class so if we have any questions from Mazar please I'm sure he'll be happy to stop and take questions or discuss uh, at any point along the way. Thank you very much good afternoon everybody so uh, I would be just sharing my experiences whatever I learned from mainly three people, uh, Dr. Helen Zantaki, Dr. Lisa Webley, and uh, Professor Abram Shah. So I take them as, uh, to all of them, as my parents for the research family around here. And uh, now coming to the point of how to complete the PhD in three years time. My experience is that uh, whatever we read all along our research, instead of putting it aside, it's better to write, 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 write. And if we write at least one, two pages at the start, and uh, in three years time, we end up with nearly 200,000, 250,000 words very easily. And uh, by the end of second year of research, normally uh, we are nearly finalizing our hypothesis and then we can pick and choose out of that 250,000 words, whatever is related to our hypothesis, and we can leave the rest for our publications in the third year. And then we can include the same thing in our bibliography and uh, that gives a very good impression for the final viva because when if we have got two or three publications related to our research which are published in peer review journal so examiners at the end are normally confident enough that at least six scholars have certified this person or candidate as a scholar, so it, it makes their job easier in the end to certify you as a scholar. So the key to my experience is reading, writing, reading, writing. And uh, in the first year, normally, the student have a problem, which is that what they they normally get a comment from the supervisors that this is descriptive, this is not analytical. So the difference between description and analysis. So I can I just ask first of all, you said you were writing material at the first from the start, one or two pages a day. Did you find that was good quality stuff or did you just write down anything just to get something down on the paper? No, good quality and relevant to the research mm -hmm. but every person has his own capability and quality so some people for example for me for my first chapter I received a comment from my supervisor uh, Professor Helen Muntaki that uh, this is very well written and this is one of the best few chapters that I have so far seen in my research but how it relates to your hypothesis. Mm. This was the first comment. So every person has his own God-gifted capabilities of putting the things in writing. But if someone is deficient in that, then I learned it by reading the other people's work. Okay? So the more and more you read, it, read along your research work, the more and more you learn how to express it in words form on a paper or on your computer. 
just on that point, Mazar, because I have the same supervisor, and she said something similar. But my first chapter, it's very interesting, and it was 30,000 words long, um, but it's not really relevant <laughs> to your thesis. And she was right, because I think at the start, you need to do the work to understand the subject. And then once you do that and understand the subject, then you do it. It is quite descriptive because you have to figure out yourself what the subject is about. And then once you've done that, then later on you can go on to do the proper proper analytical work, which builds upon the stuff that you've done at the start, but you probably will delete most of the stuff you've done at the start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which so I've got to counter up for a second. My my experience of doing peer reviewed stuff that's published is that it takes so incredibly long to actually appear in print. Um, for a, to do a PhD in within three years, you'd actually have to have written it almost as soon as you started, because it can take a good two years to get published. Mm -hmm. So um, I like the idea of doing stuff for peer-reviewed journals, uh, but it makes me think, God, I have to start like immediately. <laughs> Would it be um, advantageous in regards to the publishing? If probably you were, I'm in the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, so I know the HRC, so maybe liaising with them before and trying to see whether or not you can do that, that kind of thing before, so that you have a head start, I don't know. I think I agree entirely with Maso that it is really good for your PhD thesis if in your exam you can say, and chapter one has been published in this journal, because it does mean that some other scholars have said, yes, this has got the mark of quality to it. Um, but it, you're right, it does take a lot of time, and it depends what journal. If you're lucky with a journal, because I know I do quite a lot of peer review, and if you're lucky, you can get in within a couple of months, but sometimes you can be very unlucky, it can take a well, year or more. One solution, Ronan, might, might actually be for us to submit things to our own um, law journal, or whatever it's called. Yeah, the student. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes. yeah that might be a way of um, That's true. speeding up the process. I think there's um, there's a certain amount of what's the word, uh, nearly snobbishness about student law journals. And I know having having worked with Mazar on the student law journal, I think sometimes it's not as highly regard it isn't as highly regarded as a, a proper journal. So it doesn't quite have the same cachet that publishing in a proper journal would have. Yeah. But it is a good idea. Um, but if you know the people in the journal or the people in the area, then I think if you can speak to them in advance about it, that is a really good thing to do. So I know that um, something in my PhD, um, I've had two pieces published already, and then I've got them published, and then I've developed them even more in the actual chapter. So yes. it's, it's helped it's helped the writing of the chapter a lot as well. So if you can speak to them in advance and say, is this within the scope of the journal? Is this a, a, the type of thing you will publish? Do you think this is good enough quality? And then getting it in there is really helpful. Yes, sir. Secondly, uh, there is one more thing that instead of publishing your own chapters as it is, or with certain modifications, uh, my idea on top of that is that it would be good if we publish the additional work that we have done instead of the core work of the thesis. For example, you need 80,000 words for your PhD and end of the day by the time you uh, finalize your hypothesis you have got 150,000 words. So instead of publishing out of that 80,000 words it is better to publish out of the leftover work and then you can uh, relate it somehow within your body of thesis. In you can add some footnotes about that, and then that's how you can add it to your bibliography. Did, did you have anything directly in your thesis which was actually published beforehand? No, 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 no. Did, not a single word of my core thesis. It was all the leftover work that was published and that was added as a bibliography for certain things. Like, for example, if I, uh, because I had too much in line, so it was not possible for me, I wanted to, pub to present everything mm -hmm. to the examiners, but it was not possible for me to go beyond 100,000 words. So the additional, uh, the leftover work that I wanted to present, I presented it through the bibliography.
like I just gave footnotes in like uh, if for certain analysis and giving conclusion, mm -hmm. if I had to add, for example, 20 pages in my thesis or nearly 10,000 words, it's better if I just write the conclusion in my thesis and give a footnote and refer it to my okay. article. Okay. So you just had your own articles and yes, refer to yes, the footnotes? Yes, yes. At appropriate places. Okay. I would have done more. <laughs> I, yeah. I would have, if I had an article published, I would have, you know, made it more obvious that I had an article published to sort of to get more credit for it. Yeah, but when you put everything in bibliography, then that is the credibility, anyway. Yeah, and secondly, um, uh, one more thing that that was told to me that uh, it is better to have the publications mentioned in your bibliography and refer it somehow if you know your examiners well in advance time it's better because normally it is said that whenever someone comes he's of your field and uh, he or she is of your field and area of expertise and whenever someone comes up he always looks at the bibliography and if he finds his own name in there Okay, so it it gives an edge. So, uh, but this is not hard and fast rule. But as supposedly the examiner is from uh, your research area, so it's better to mention him and uh, and your own uh, publications also. But uh, every, so of course, this is subject to knowing your yes, of course, your examiner. Of course. Two years ahead of your examination date. No, 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 not, not, not so, not so. Uh, normally, by the third year, by the time you have finalized your hypothesis, you are in the process of structuring your uh, thesis. Okay, by that time, nearly six months ahead of your completion date, uh, normally the supervisors discuss. I like the word choice of normal day yes. because I find that very odd. Normally, you get to know who's your examiner a few weeks ahead of it. That's how I have noticed. Even yes. uh, Salim, who is quite conscious, he recently discovered. And I discovered 15 days before my survivor. And I, I don't know if anyone has this book. I don't think we have any. When did you discover it in your case? That was nearly three to four months before. That That's very lucky, very old. Yeah. So, and uh, but it comes with its own effects also, bad effects also. That if you have misread the mm. work of the examiner, you are in for it, and you misquote it, and then because the person who would be examining you be the author of that thing and if you have misquoted, misunderstood it, then you can expect the same level of drilling also mm -hmm. in the end and uh, potential rewrite. Although, would you say that that's where your supervisor comes in? I don't know. To assist on the line that you're taking? Yes, you know, uh, here comes the role of the supervisor or what is his job, his or her job. His or her job is not to, to me, to my understanding, is not to confirm that whether you have misread or read it properly. His or her job is to guide you about the structure, the methodology, the hypothesis, and to some extent the originality of the work. And whether it uh, conforms to the regulations or not. So he or she probably is not going to, you know, test the authority of your conclusions. Or that is your work. You have done it. You need to defend it. Hence, then, are you saying? So this is a question. Um, the line that you take on the author, and um, that's going to be for probably examining you. Um, do you not have? A sounding board that you can make sure that you're on the same, you're the right line. You don't want to fall into that trap. Uh, so, 
Okay, my question then is, how do you not You know, uh, when someone is do when someone has done research for three years on a one pinpoint thing, then nobody expects that he would ever misread or misquote mm -hmm. any authoritative work. This is highly improbable. And if so happens, then the examiners are justified in saying that you have not spent your three years time properly. So this is I would think if you are, I think it is a good idea to cite an author if that author is your examiner. I think it's I think it'd be really an obvious gap in your work if you haven't quoted someone who's in the principal in the field and they're examining you. But I think you just have to be much more cautious about it and maybe go back and check again what they have read, or sorry, what they have written and what you've written about them just to make sure that you're actually getting them right. And it depends also on the author. Some authors don't mind people disagreeing with them and they actually like argument and debate. Some authors aren't like that though and, and they don't tolerate dissent in that way. So it's quite a difficult one. And I think if this is where maybe your supervisor can come in and find out if that author is the type of person who welcomes debate or doesn't welcome debate. You know, selection and choice of examiners and the role of students in that and uh, uh, the role of supervisors, that is a very tricky kind of job. Thank you. So, you know, uh, the personality also matters a lot. For example, if the candidate is submissive enough and he doesn't argue much and he tends to always resolve the things amicably and if he is caught in the hands of the examiners who always grill so that is a mismatch and uh, if the examiners are very gentle kind enough and experienced polite and uh, the student is kind of some hard kind of, I don't have appropriate words, but I hope everybody understands what I mean. As someone abrasive? <laughs> <laughs> so in that case, again, that is a mismatch. So, uh, and if such kind of situation arises, then uh, it's a student who needs to change himself or herself and deal with the thing as a part of examining process to deal with the things appropriately. Yeah. That time. Just pick up on that point. Sorry. Sorry. Examining process, uh, uh, it is my experience and I am one of many who may not have the same or have my identical experience that it is very essential to take note during the examination process, no matter how difficult it is. Because the reporting of events afterwards may not actually reflect the exact situation that took place in the examination. It's really important to take note during the examination. And why do they say that? It doesn't matter. Yeah. But I don't know what the regulations say about this kind of thing that the recording is supposed to be someone else there, quite neutral, from what I understand. You know, examiners are normally supposed to be neutral persons, they are not party. Not participating in the examination process. Yeah. Is someone witnessing the examination More process? More or less. Yes. yes. Sometimes it may so. I, th I think under the rules here, I think you're if you want to, you're entitled to ask for a third person who's a yeah. neutral person yeah. to be involved, but that's maybe... That's what I was told by a long, long time ago when we all attended one of the usual things, as we are attending yeah. today. I think just to pick up on Mazar's point about the examiners, um, if you've ever appeared in court, one of the things we learned was always know your judge. So you have to know who the judge is, and then you can plead your case to the judge. So I think you have to do the same kind of research with your examination, so we know who your examiner is going to be, and then make sure you're, if you have the chance, like Mazar, to know in advance who your examiners are, then you can direct your thesis accordingly, and also know how to deal with them in the examination, so knowing if someone is abrasive or conciliatory, 
or if they expect you to argue with and fight with them, or they'll be upset if you're abrasive with them. And I know whenever Ahmed was going into your exam, we had a lot of discussion about indeed, what indeed. way you were going to indeed. deal with um, the examiners. Absolutely. But there is one more principle of the prep phase which doesn't apply to the viva, and that is that we may lose our case, but we should not lose the judge. <laughs> so that doesn't apply to the research because we cannot lose our thesis and win the examiners. We need to do the both at the same time. We need to do both. Okay, now coming to the point of uh, analysis. So that is the comment that everybody receives, normally receives uh, in the first year that this is all descriptive, this is not analytical. This is the difference of search and research. We do hard to find the books and paragraphs and it, sometimes it takes days to find an article, a journal from, uh, from a journal in the library. So that is a search process. We cannot take it as a research process. Research comes after application of mind on it. That what you think about that. For example, in this room, we can describe that there are white walls, blue shades, eight to nine windows, white lights, a few portraits around, two doors. This is description. But if we start with that this is very bright and airy room, it has got white lights, it has got two doors, it has got so many windows. And this is a good room. Now, when you have applied your mind on this description by concluding that this is a good room, this is a bright room. So, the whole description in the middle and by adding something on the top and in the end, this description is analysis. So, search, research, and application of mind. So this is something which is expected from a researcher that he, would, he or she would apply his mind on it to conclude something. And whether that conclusion is based on sound reasons is question of methodology. For example, there are certain things for which you may need to look at the statutes or provisions of law only. But for some conclusions, the appropriate methodology or the source is interviewing the experts. So if some conclusion needs it, it, it varies from case to case, but again, if you need to interview the people to base your conclusion on sound reasoning, but you don't interview, but rely on the literature review for that purpose, then that conclusion would not be based on sound reasoning, and your methodology would be faulty, and that analysis, though would be analysis, but may not be of that help for research purposes. Now, what methodology is to be used, what sources are to be considered, it is a question that cannot be answered by, in some certain sense, that, that relies on, that is based on every case, different research point. So there is no hard and fast rule for that. But normally, in the research of law, doctrinal approach is adopted, and uh, the sources are normally the statute book, the case laws precedents, and uh, ac academic literature. And these are normally three sources, or sometimes the interviews. That is the general standard, but it may vary from case to case. So.
So, Masa, can you tell us a bit about the process of how you actually physically worked on your PhD? How you, how you did it on a day to day basis? How much you read? How much you wrote? The, the, the nature of your work, how much effort did you have to put into it? Um, sorry, can I ask you to preface as well? You know, where did your idea come from? How did you, you know, when were you thinking about the idea to make sure that you're going to be on that three year timeline? You know, uh, I never had a timeline that I'd, I'll be finishing it in this much time, but uh, what I did was that. I never missed even a Sunday to, for research and that was, uh, most of the times I was the last one who was leaving Eilis. I can vouch for that. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that's true actually because mm -hmm. uh, as I'm going to say to my wife, I don't think I've ever met a good lazy lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah. it, um, all this is a function of yeah. work. Yeah. And yeah. When I see uh, people say it's three years, 35 hours a week, you're lucky if you get a holiday. Mm -hmm. um, I sort of think to myself, well, actually, if a lawyer was doing it, a practicing lawyer was doing that full time, that would be um, like only half time. Because yes. you regularly 70, 80, even 90 hours a week. Yeah. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. yeah. So it's, um, I love the idea about being very structured. I mean, yes. I, I actually, every day, I keep a timesheet, yeah, and mm -hmm. that's simply because I work to a timesheet, and I tell mm -hmm. myself, "You are doing six or eight hours," mm -hmm. and I don't go to bed till I've done them. Yeah. And that's it. So, yeah. it it's pathetic, <laughs> but it works it's for me anyway. You know, sorry, we think analyzing both questions from you and from from my comment is that when you start. You got to start with a challenge in your mind's eye. You got to start with the challenge, the reason why you are addressing your entire life for this very, very purpose. So it's got to be the question that you want to challenge it. What is the problem? Where does the problem lie in? How do I get to the problem? Do I have an answer to this problem within the existing legal system? To me, that is the first step of any research. Please comment if you disagree with that. You cannot simply go on reading ad infinitum and writing ad infinitum like I have if you don't have a purpose for your reading. Yes, we, we always have the purpose, and that is the hypothesis, in fact, that we start with. Thank you. So we start with the hypothesis, even before publishing. Thank you. But I, I think Lady Dale was saying, um, how do you get the idea in the first place? Yeah. Uh, which then leads to the hypothesis, presumably. Yeah. And, um, I mean, my experience so far is that it, it almost has to be vocational. There, there's something that you feel so strongly about. That nothing's going to stop you doing it. And for me, it took me a while to actually narrow it down to something quite small because I wanted to change the world. <laughs> yes, another thing uh, to my experience is that, that, I, that I have observed and seen is that normally the students who come, like, who do their O levels, A levels, GCSE, then LLB, then LPC or whatever practice or LLM or coming to PhD directly at the age of 23, 24, they take more time to complete the PhD. But the people who come with a practical experience and then comes to the research, then they are much used to of doing the thing quickly and practically, and then their uh, you know capability of analysis and understanding that what is analysis and what is description is much uh, mature than what is of normally the the candidates who are coming in continuation of their academic you know continuity. My experience before coming to the PhD was that 
uh, I was uh, working as a judge in my local jurisdiction there. And uh, we used to do the courts from 8 till 3 o'clock. And then after 3 o'clock till late 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, we used to give dictation to the stenographers for the judgments and everything. So having done that for a longer period of time after my LLB and then coming to PhD, so the switching was from practice kind of thing to academic, that was the only difference. But uh, the habit of, you know, instead of giving dictation and typing it our own and the capability of analysis and capability of summing up the things and uh, that was, I think that was the difference that I was able to upgrade even within six months of start of my PhD. So, so the Maza, that your advice is that you should all work for 10 years first of all no, no, <laughs> as a judge. Not for 10 years, <laughs> but <laughs> within it's like 20 years. <laughs> my, my point of saying is that, uh, 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 you know, bringing this point here is that if someone is not able to complete it in three years or is not able to upgrade up till two years or is not able to produce two chapters up till one and a half year, okay, then he, sh he or she should not be disheartened because if someone can do it, he may have different experience of his life. He may have different capabilities. So that is not the standard that everybody should do it. And uh, uh, one should understand the reason behind that, that um, if someone is doing PhD at the age of 40 or after that, and someone will get the premium of that qualification from the age of 24 or 25 or 26 years. So if someone completes it in five years instead of three years, but starts at the age of 24 years, and one completes it in two or three years, but starts it at 40, 41, 42 years of age, then again, someone who is starting it at the age of 24 will get the fruits of his qualification for a longer period. So there is a balancing exercise either way, if someone doesn't or someone does. I'm, I'm sorry if I raise my hand. Uh, I'm 67 years old and I started at the age of quite late and I finished within 18 months without actually finishing. But I did finish within 18 months. One downfall of starting very late is your memory capacity. And believe me, at the age of 60, 65, the second downfall is health issues. They can really creep on you without you anticipating. I mean, I hate women sitting next to me with a short sleeve because I see myself 40 years ago. But then when he comes to my age, you probably have arthritis. So every issue, every issue of health, don't leave it to age of 65. And you don't all have Gran here to support with her prayers because I need it. So do it as soon as you can. I mean, no exception to the rule. As soon as you can, knowingly, intentionally, but methodologically and persistently. Can you answer, address the question then of when you had your idea or when your idea crystallized? Was that at the start or was it halfway through your thesis? Of the hypothesis of or of the time? Yeah. Of, your, of your hypothesis? That was nearly after one year that I found out. Because by that time I had nearly four chapters written nearly 150,000 words. So I knew that whatever, what I had done. And so I just finalized it. That, you know, but to have a clear hypothesis, we need to have strong conclusions. And we cannot arrive at the strong conclusion unless we have ended up our research. Not the thesis, the research. And we can end up our research in one year or one and a half year, and then we can uh, finalize our hypothesis. And then we can restructure our thesis that may take six months, eight months, and then we can do additional readings, then we finalize and narrow down our hypothesis. 
because in the start we read everything that comes across but in the end when you have clarified your hypothesis you even don't read the whole book or whole article you just straight away go to that paragraph and then read it because by that time you know that what you want what is your aim what is your focus I find just on that point that the further I've got into the thesis, the more I have started focusing my research like that. So I know I need to research a particular point or I need a particular a, a quote on a particular issue. And then I will need to skim through an article until I find this is the bit that I w I'm really interested in. And then I'll, I'll read that bit and maybe quote a bit of that and then move on. Whereas I think at the start, it is like a, a shotgun approach. It just, you, you, the research goes out over a very wide area. And it's only as you progress and you refine your ideas and you refine your hypothesis that you will be much more directed, aiming directly at the point that, that you want to yes. make for your thesis. Yes. Would you say, therefore, in your time scale and schedule of events, that within the first year, one should establish a title to the thesis? And that title should actually reflect uh, the hypothesis and the gist and therefore the remaining timetable, the remaining processes of proving your case. One need to be clarified about the structures of his thesis, uh, the chapters and what every chapter would contain and what would be the conclusions of every chapter and how, you know, how we will make a loop of introduction and conclusion chapter passing through each chapter. So I don't know if you can know at the start what your because the, the title will change as well and your hypothesis changes as well. Yes, it, that's why I'm saying that by the end of first year or one and a half years, you should. Uh, if someone is doing research, reading, writing, reading, writing, he or she would have minimum 50,000 words in his thesis and maximum maybe 100 plus. And by that time, one at least knows, one, one at, at least we have certified his or her conclusions or clarified the conclusions. And anything can change even later, even a day before the thesis. And then they can restructure everything. But that is the time when at least someone is somewhere. And that's a time when students are normally upgraded from MP to PhD. Can I get an idea of how much time people spend on a PhD on a daily basis? Calvin, you said you do like maybe six or eight hours a day on it? Uh, I, uh, well, if I look back over the last five months, it's about 35 hours a week. It doesn't mean more than that at the moment because I'm still doing other stuff. But, um, that, that will go up, I'm sure, and I, I, I do that spread out over every every single day rather okay. than just a, during the weekdays. Mm -hmm. What does everyone else do? How much time does everyone else spend? I'd say that's about okay. the 35. Over, over seven days. Because mm -hmm. the guilt keeps in on Sunday morning. That's exactly right, yes. Yeah. Or, or, or you're doing other work on a weekday yeah. or whatever. Can I show everybody 60 hours a day? Surprise you, you got the PhD in your bed. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure. Somebody told me he spends uh, seven hours every day, minimum seven hours. He's gotten his PhD in one person. Make sure he spends seven hours every day. What, five days a week or seven days six a week? Days a week. Six days a week. So Sunday is free. So seven times six is uh, like 42. Uh, you know, to my experience, there is no set time target as such because the person who is doing research is always in that phase and mode, even if he or she is uh, uh, on the breakfast table or is having dinner or is about to sleep or is anywhere in the bus, in the train. And uh, that used to happen with me that sometimes when I'm traveling from I was traveling from uh, uh, ILS to home and some question that was 
uh, in my mind for last seven days. And at once, when uh, I was thinking, 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 and that knot was, you know, resolved. And then at that moment, what I used to do is that uh, I used to make a note on my mobile phone of that sentence or statement, sometimes a paragraph. And then the first thing I used to do after reaching home was that I used to open my laptop and put that in there. You know, sometimes we uh, keep on uh, researching for a week, but we don't get what we actually want. But sometimes in split of a second, we get something that gives us idea of, you know, was 20,000 words to start something new. So there is no exact time frame. So, but there is, a, of course, we need to read, 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 read with consistency. Uh, that may be in the morning, that may be in the evening. But one thing that actually dis disturbs the research thoughts and research process is that, you know, here's a phone and we put the same in it, sometimes one number, sometimes other number. In the brain, if someone has put the same of research and in the evening he takes that out and puts the same of the work, then it's really difficult and hard to put the things, two things at the same yeah, time. Single mindedness. And uh, that was another point that I didn't do anything apart from research all along three years. So morning, evening, all the time, just thinking about yeah, research. Yeah. And my hypothesis focus and everything. Because uh, if you change your mind from one thing to another thing, then coming back to research takes sometimes days and a few hours. So that's, in fact, the thing that takes time and slows down the speed of research. Do you do um, some qualitative work? executive interviews or was it purely really theoretical? No, there were interviews, there were interviews, but uh, not many uh, like kind of, uh, uh, you know, survey, but uh, the interviews of the authoritative experts in the field. And, and, and how many of those did you do? Uh, 15 or 20. Okay, well that's about one. Well. I'm, I'm trying to look at the way you, you did it within the three years and just see, uh, it, it is impressive maybe because if it had been purely theoretical, you mm -hmm. would have been distracted by the process of interviewing people and transcribing and coding and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you, you did that as well? Yeah, uh, no, I didn't get your question exactly. Well, whether your research was purely theoretical or whether you did it with some interviews and things. And you, know, you answered my question yeah. because you said you did. Yes, I did interviews, but that was not for that was for one of the chapters in fact, but the rest of that was theoretical. But again, uh, even if it is theoretical, that takes time and I think just on the point you're making about focusing on it, because I work as well as doing the PhD, yeah. it's very difficult to switch the mindsets. And if I haven't done PhD for a while, it takes several hours at least to sort of get into the mindset of PhD and then picking up where you left off. It's not something that you can just go straight back into and start writing straight away. You have to think about it again or get into the mindset or read what you've done before and then start writing again. Now, uh, if we don't do any of the work, then it is easier to. So that is what you are asking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's work it's outside to, the PhD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I tend to agree with his conclusion, with my own experience, and forgive me, since I'm talking about myself on a regular basis. I was a practicing tax lawyer. And when I realized that I can carry both loads, I dropped the practice completely. And I satisfied myself finishing the cases that were unfinished. A tax case can last three, four years. Therefore, I'm actually finding disruption in my research 
is I have to get ready for it. And I have one final case left, although PhD finished, <laughs> supposedly finished, and the case hasn't finished. So I can't help sharing your view and, and why Galvin has to, Galvin has to uh, keep timetable, because these two horses cannot run and pull the same cart at the same time, because they are not made of the same strength, they are not made of the same capacity, and they are not made of the same uh, capacity. One pulls the other one, yes. turns the cart down immediately. Yes. And instead of risking that, just focus. Um, because it's very solid, and I think uh, I'm going to ask you, because you're actually doing that, and I think you, you are putting that so it's working, so how do you choose? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Maz was saying, everybody's different. Mm, and yes. for me, even when I was a student, I was also working at the same time, but I've never been able to, I, for me, the thrill is the balance. Yes. Whereas for other people, it's a complete distraction. And it probably means I'll become a lot shallower. Not at all, <laughs> not at all. I, I like doing different things, and that's what excites me. Uh, the idea of spending three years doing absolutely nothing. Uh, for me, that's not the way, um, but I've, I've dramatically scaled back my corporate work. Right? Um, but at the same time, um, I wouldn't want to give it up completely. Uh, those are my clients who want to talk to me again. <laughs> <laughs> Where's he gone? Did he die? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, because um, I must admit, I agree with the, um, your notion of you know, dedicating your time, mm -hmm. but I'm kind of like, I haven't actually had the opportunity to study without work. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, I would want to do that in the future, and I don't want to take my time like that. And I think that, you know, if I don't have a, even if it's a penciled-in timeline, it can go on forever, and I didn't want to, you know, fall prey to that. Forgive me, I don't want to mislead you. I mean, through my O-levels and A-levels, and throughout, I had to wash dishes. Mm -hmm. So there hasn't been a time of luxury. Work and studying always went hand in hand, but this is one stage yes. where the quality and quantity are highly important. It would touch the lives of everybody. Your, M your MA or even your BA doesn't or didn't touch the lives of anybody, but if anyone reads your academic input and the significance and the value of it will be self-evident anyway, it will touch the lives of I think I was going to say, I was going to find out how you dealt with your um, footnotes because I'm um, it's like they have covered I've been very careful covering them field as if you but I find going back some have dropped or slipped. So I don't know if you have any tips. Uh, for the footnotes, uh, how you missed the footnotes, mm. for example, what happens? Like whenever you are writing. You put a footnote yeah, it makes sure then and there. But going back, I find some have skipped, especially when you cut and paste, you know, write something that goes in some way, you know, that fits in some way, and you know, you've written something, maybe a paragraph, and you find something else that will be, you know, um, the word? relevant. You know, you put it in and find it. When you put EBIT, for example, you find that EBIT, does not correspond to the next one. And I guess it's a question of being very careful. But mm -hmm. you, no matter how you, careful you are, it's like... Try the referencing manager, yeah. Yeah, like right. Endnote. Okay. <coughs> I've found it quite good. You can set it up as however you like. Thank you. I think that's the way that um, I overcame the, you know, deleting something if you've almost gone or whatever, and the numbering, but once you... I've got that, I think the, I think it was a referencing. Yeah. Um, Endnote, the referencing like manager. It does it for yourself. You, you know, if you, delete, if you delete number two or whatever, then it will reframe whatever was below to number two. So it's it very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, on that, I haven't used Endnote, but I, I use Zotero, and it's quite good for doing all those references, and it will normally, if you've, you know, inserted something else, it will normally fix the cross-reference to make sure it's correct, but I think at the end 
you'll just have to edit it, yeah. edit it manually and just make sure yeah. all the cross references are done, and that will probably take quite a long time. It really do. does. I mean, I don't know if it does. EndNote do it, all those things automatically then? Yeah. Yeah, if you take something out, it, it'll re okay, reformat so it. Okay, it so if you have a note, note C note 5, and then you change something else, it will automatically say actually C note 7? You, you can do that in Word. Okay. So if you, if you use it too mm -hmm. intelligently enough, you can actually get it to do it all itself. Mm -hmm. okay. so. That's brilliant. Well beyond me, dear. Don't worry. <laughs> in that case, you're going to do, give us a class. He just invited himself. <laughs> you know, Narayan upstairs, yes. he gives mm -hmm. classes for this. Yes, yes. Um, Narayan, one of the, um, the computer yes. people in the yes. library, he does give classes yes. and tutorials. And the like, Yes. Endnote? Does he do Endnote yes. as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so and there's a one-to-one -one session also. Yes. Pascali as well. Yes. Pascali. Yes, he will. Uh, so Narayan and uh, Lindsay. 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 Yes, Lindsay. yes, yes, yes. Very useful. I relied on them completely. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you're having any word problems or Endnote or mm, yeah. citations, then I would definitely okay. um, speak to them. And they also help a lot with formatting. Mm -hmm. And they, 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 they pagination the contents page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there is no hard and fast rule. Every person is different. Every person has his own experiences. So, I shared my experiences. And you people may have your own experiences. That may be authoritative. That may be valid also. And it's just sharing of experience. So, uh, the point of uh, that only doing the research or work and something like that. So, Things work differently with different people. Okay, so everybody gets tired and bored from one work, and after switching to another thing, then one gets energy and boosts up for after the change. So we can take it that doing another work may be a change for another start for the next day. So do you ever really? fed up or demoralized then whenever you're doing it myself? Yeah, many times. <laughs> many times. And how did, how did you overcome that? You don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just thinking that uh, this is a day and I need to do this. This is the day and I kept on doing it that it will end one day. It will end one day. It's a little prayer. Thank you very yeah. much. And one thing that I always say that I always thought whenever you know, during lunch time, I used to pass through this Russell uh, Square Garden, mm -hmm. and uh, I always see sort of people sitting around, and I thought that one day when I'll finish, I'll someday sit here. <laughs> <laughs> and after finishing my PhD, I got busy in other work that I didn't get time. You can't sit on a massa. Yeah, no. Uh, even now I can't sit because I'll have to go to parent-teacher meeting for my children. Did your family notice the difference between when you were doing your PhD and when you were doing, say, your first degree or postgraduate or professional qualification? Did they say, my God, this looks like much more work, or did they regard it as a natural evolution? As natural evolution. So yeah. perhaps you were particularly well organized, actually, be, be, because my, my wife's noticed the difference already in that I positively clear my diary of other stuff to give myself enough time. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you've actually got to be quite sort of tough about it and just say, I'm going to the library for eight hours or ten hours. Whereas before, it was much easier mm -hmm. because you, you could do your research anywhere, but you didn't have to go to the library and get on with it. It will test every aspect of our lives. It tests it. Just, just a point. What are your thoughts on, um, it's just probably tying the, the uh, peer-reviewed journal idea and keeping on track and doing some, and the, the time issues that you were saying about the, um, the time between writing and actually publishing. What do you think about blogging? That, that would fill that, that sort of problem. But the blogging will not, uh, uh, you are talking about the blogs which are on the internet for different things. Yeah, yeah. yeah set up okay. a blog. You cannot mention that of 
Well, you're a bibliography. No, no, but just about keeping uh, a, some sort of writing going. So you, you're researching uh, the blog that you're writing. It may, it, it's, a, it's a happy medium between uh, doing the peer-reviewed journal and perhaps just keeping something going all the time. Yes. To keep, you, keep an idea yeah. going. Yeah. 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 And you can learn from the comments of the people also. Yeah, and feedback. And feedback. And then if there is really worth mentioning a uh, comment, then you need to mention specifically in your mm. biblio that these were the comments made. And that's a good way of research also. Yeah. You, you just throw an idea and then you get the comments. Mm. Yeah.